grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. How big is your God? Does he hold the whole world in his hands? He does, but we have trouble believing this. Believing exactly what he tells us. And it is a continual struggle. As long as we remain in the flesh. But yet the church is called holy. How is the church holy? Are we holy? Are we righteous because we shower and put on our nice Sunday clothes? Does that increase your righteousness? Does bowing and folding your hands and singing on pitch make you righteous before God? No, these are all outward things. Even going to church by itself is not divine. For sleeping in a pew does not make you more holy than sleeping at home. <laughs> Neither gives eternal life. If God is more here right now than elsewhere, then that is not a God that can really help you very much. For what if you miss church because you're in the hospital or nursing home? Or what if you're driving in bad weather? Is Christ with you? Yes, he is. For he is God, and all is his, because he made it. Our actions and our thoughts are limited, and they're sinful. But thankfully, what we think does not define our God, does not determine how much he helps us. And this is a problem we have. We made God smaller than he actually is. And thinking that our problems are perhaps too big. Not trusting God, we make them to be bigger than the Lord who made heaven and earth. And we think that perhaps God can't handle it. So we won't even bother asking him in prayer. We'll rely instead on our own devices, the solutions that we come up with, thus denying our Lord and setting ourselves up as the real Savior, the one who can really get answers and solutions, instead of simply obeying his law and trusting where he leads us. For the worst sin are not the things that you see on the news. They're not the outward things. All sin is rooted in idolatry. That is having a false god. This is something that we are guilty of too by making God smaller in our own minds. But the root of this is in our hearts. And this cannot be fixed as easily as changing bad habits in the words we use. We cannot root out our evilness. There is no surgeon skilled enough to do that. Sin clings closer to us than our own skin. So do not rely on yourselves or your own powers for salvation. Solomon was asked by God to build a temple, a dwelling place for God, a house. And this is the first permanent dwelling for God before the Ark of the Covenant went along and was put in a tabernacle, a tent. But why does God need a house? Does he need a bed so he can rest? Does he need a fridge to keep his drinks cold? Does he need a coat rack to put his jacket on? No, of course not. So Solomon, at the dedication of the temple, declares, What will God, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. That was a magnificent building of the finest materials. No, it was not to contain God. That was not the purpose at all. And neither does this building or any church contain God. It does not enclose Him. And God is not poor that He needs our offerings so He can buy some food. Why do we do these things as a congregation? We gather together to comfort one another in a common confession of Christ. And especially so that God can tell us about himself. So he's not limited by what we think, by our fears, by our struggles. No, Christ is true God, Lord of all, and he is your Lord. When we leave this building, we do not leave Christ. He does not leave us. 
Our Lord demands holiness. This is not optional. If we think that we are holy, woe is us. Instead, God gives us very specific ways to show our love for Him. So how do we love God? Not by some idea of God and thinking holy in spiritual thoughts, but by loving our neighbor who we can see, who we can touch. The Ten Commandments direct us, our love for God toward our spouse, toward the estate of marriage, to our parents, to our children, to all of our neighbors. And that's a lot harder than loving an idea of God in our minds. Because we know our neighbors, we know our spouse, they don't deserve our love. They're not perfect. But that is exactly what God demands. To show us that we do not love Him. To think that God hears our words and respects us because of our deeds is idolatry. It leads to death. For our thoughts, our ideas cannot contain the Lord of heaven and earth. He is much bigger. So why was there a temple at all? Temple at all? Was it, what was it for? But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and earth and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house I have built. The temple was built for sinners, not for God, so that they would be able to find salvation in his name at this place, to know where to go. God, of course, fills all things. God is out in the woods. He is in nature. But he has not called you to worship him there, to find him there. People who do that invent a God of their own making. So, for example, God does not want to be found by dancing in the woods at midnight. He is there, but he has not called you to find him there. He will not be for you there. There is no forgiveness in the trees. For whatever we do is corrupted. And that applies to even our best acts of worship, even the acts of worship here. For all our acts of worship are like offering someone a glass of water that is 50% gasoline. It may be a nice gesture to offer someone something to drink, but it could be deadly. And that's how worship is if we choose it, if it involves us in any way at all. So true worship is something that God works in us and according to his command. Do we come here because God is more here in this building so that we can get more holy? No, we are always those things, but we have trouble believing it because of the temptations we face. We need to hear that God is bigger than us, is bigger than our problems. And this is a continual thing to live in Christ, especially to hear that God is bigger than our sins. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God, listen to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, My name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. What does this say? That God would listen to sinners at this place. And that's what happens here. God's name is proclaimed. And that's more important than things we do. What did Jesus say? Where two or three are gathered, in Jesus' name, there he is. In this pulpit, this signifies something. You probably do not have a pulpit in your living room. No, this pulpit signifies that your pastors are obligated to speak for Christ. And you're to listen to the words of Christ as if Christ is speaking to you. It's a burden to speak for God, but it is for your salvation. So the words cannot be ignored. No, if they are the truth. For what is the best worship? It's not something we do. It's hearing the words of God and believing them. And knowing they are for you. For God is for you. You don't need a temple to go. And you are holy outside this church, in fact. You are now his temple. Your very body is called the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you were baptized, 
you received all of Christ in the Spirit. So the very essence of worship is faith, trusting that God is good to us. The very same God who controls the nations, who controls the world events, He bled for you. No selfish thought, nothing you have done will sink you. Christ bore all punishment in His own body, and He was cursed. But Christ is not merely a man, not us. In Christ we find God. We find the true God who saves in human flesh and blood. So don't look in your body. Look to the body which died and rose again. We have an important passage in Colossians. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In Christ we have all of God, the fullness of God, that means he's bigger than our problems. He is bigger than this world. He is bigger than everything. And in Christ, he's not just big, he's also love. We know him as love itself. But outside of Jesus' word, there's only death and destruction and hell. But we stay in Christ, not by the things we do, but by his word. We are transferred from death to life. We're given life here, not just for a week. For a month, but for all time, even after our body is put into the ground, we will be resurrected. And so what is the most important thing about this church? What is proclaimed about Christ, what Christ himself says. We do not want God's word mixed with man's word, someone's opinion. The teaching of a church is what matters most, because that's how Christ comes to us. Your personal history, your connections to the church, they're minor compared to having the voice of Christ. For you come to hear the voice of the one who is Lord of all, of heaven and earth, and to know that he has chose you to believe and have life, and to continue in that life by hearing his word. And Jesus, your God, is not distant. He's not too big to care for you. He's not too busy running the world. No, in Christ, you have the fullness of God. That means you can honor him everywhere. He is with you, helping you at all times. And we know this with hope. For baptism means the gospel is for you. It was given to you. Christ died for your sins. Out of all the world, he has chosen you to have life through life. And so we do not have a different God when we leave this building, or in problems, or in heartaches. No matter how much we suffer, Christ has suffered more. But he did so unjustly, out of love for us. In Christ you have the fullness of God, God who is bigger than all things, so we know nothing can separate us from him and his love. And Christ put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all the things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. This is our God, Christ Jesus. Amen.